I'd like to welcome you all and uh, thank you all for braving this uh, weather that we've been having. It's, uh, it's been enough to uh, cause many farmers a, a little bit of anguish, more than a little bit of anguish. And so, uh, welcome. Welcome to the 11th craft lecture. That's more or less 10 years ago since we started, given this is the 11th on, on the uh, Craft Foundation, the Craft Fellowship, uh, being uh, one of those pieces. Uh, we have a uh, undergraduate scholarship and then a annual lecture, of which this is the annual lecture that uh, has been going on for 11 years. It was kicked off by, uh, by a Berkeley scholar named Alex McCalla 10 years ago, and, uh, and welcome. Uh, just a uh, brief comment about time. Uh, first of all, that clock is not, uh, is not the correct time. <laughs> and uh, uh, for uh, the students in the class, I'm going to try to uh, finish the actual lecture portion of this, uh, uh, of this lecture at uh, 4 o'clock with questions extending to 4.15, something like that. And uh, these are all sort of approximate, but uh, uh, I know that the uh, time slot that uh, some students uh, are on, I have a few students here that uh, starts at 2.30 and it would normally uh, be out before four o'clock, so I'm just going to ask your indulgence to uh, finish uh, with uh, Michelle's presentation, which is very relevant to the course material of many people here. And so, before going any further, uh, so th that's the time frame that, uh, that Michelle will be more or less finished at four o'clock, and we'll uh, uh, finish questions at 4.15, 4.20 and we likely have about a 15 minutes leave there. Now, uh, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements. First of all, first and foremost, the uh, family of Daryl Craft. I'll just say a few words about Daryl. Uh, Daryl was a very special person, and uh, there's a brochure that has to do with, uh, with, with the uh, foundation that uh, this is part of or the umbrella structure for these three events. And Daryl was from Medicine Hat, from a farm family, ranch, football player, varsity football player, graduate of University of Manitoba, and a PhD from Washington State. Uh, Daryl was an exceptional academic and an exceptional person. Uh, and uh, I think that you will uh, sort of pick up a feeling for that if you pick up that brochure and sort of just take a glance at it. And this is an opportunity for us to, to basically honor an individual that we all felt near and dear to at the, at the time of Daryl's life during, as an academic. And so that's the background to, uh, to this presentation. That's background to uh, a very, very memorable individual and, uh, and we've been doing this, as I say, for 11 years to honor this individual. <laughs> Along that line, I'd like to acknowledge a few people, the, the family of Daryl Kraft, his immediate family, and, uh, and then extended family. And uh, they've been incredibly, incredibly hard workers in terms of creating this foundation. And uh, I think I'll spare Dan, Daryl's son, uh, the... Uh, 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 the uh, uh, job of, of going over the foundation and so on. And, uh, and just thank you, Dan, for all your words in the past year, year and your mom's work and that of the family in terms of this quite phenomenal uh, fundraising effort that they had to honor Daryl. And uh, if you think of the fundraising as being in the neighborhood of about three quarters of a million dollars, uh, that's more or less the case, and there's something like about $30,000 a year that uh, is spent in terms of, uh, of a fellowship, scholarship, and, uh, and this lecture. And so to the family, thank you very much. We, uh, we at the university cannot tell you how pleased and proud we are of the work that you have done in terms of honoring a very important person of your family. 
The uh, other individuals I'd like to just sort of point out, uh, the friends, uh, there are some very close friends that uh, they know who they are and, uh, and uh, have been coming to this lecture. I think there are people like the Taveses who I don't think have ever missed a, uh, a lecture. And, uh, and uh, Bill, so nice to see you, Barb. And there's many other individuals like that, uh, and the colleagues of, uh, of Daryl, uh, individuals like Paul Westall, who are in school at the same time as him, and uh, a number of other individuals. And so I just acknowledge the friends and family. Uh, I think the Dean of Agriculture may be sitting here, uh, if my eyesight's good enough to, uh, to find him. Uh, and our department head, oh, uh, no, that's not the dean. <laughs> and uh, my hand, I had a little bit of an operation here the, the other day. Uh, our department head, Derek Bruin, who uh, Daryl served as department head for a number of years. And so Derek's currently filling that role. Um, the uh, department associate uh, uh, that helps us is Surrender Cambos. And I'd like to thank Surrender now, because I sometimes leave that till the end, but I'd like to just have it up front and thank Surrender for all her work and diligence in terms of organizing uh, this function and, and, and keeping everything on track. So thank you, Surrender. Um, the, uh, uh, another person I'd like to uh, acknowledge, Farm Press. And uh, Alan Dawson, uh, I think, uh, has likely attended every one of these as well. And uh, we're at, we at the university are very, very happy at the, uh, at the attention that you've given the university over the years, at the, uh, Alan. Another individual I'd like to acknowledge is the individual who is uh, the recipient of this year's uh, Craft Fellowship. His name is, is uh, Lang Gong, and uh, Lang, where's, where's uh, Lang's over here? And so uh, congratulations, Lang. You're uh, following a great tradition. And so with, uh, with that, I think I've covered a lot of the acknowledgements. Uh, we're going to have a few uh, words of introduction by Ryan Cardwell for this year's craft lecture, Michelle Veeman. Right. Thank you, Brian. I apologize. I've, I'm just now recovering my voice ever having, after having lost it. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle today. Uh, I've known Michelle for about 15 years, I guess. We first met when I interviewed for a job in her department in 2005. Um, and, and then actually about four years later, I had the privilege of traveling to Inner Mongolia with Michelle and her husband, Terry, who's also here, where we drank fermented mare's milk and tobogganed down uh, the dunes in the Gobi Desert. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so Michelle was born in New Zealand. She spent some of her childhood on a dairy farm, which she says then motivated her to pursue further academic studies, um, which she did partly in New Zealand and then a PhD at UC Berkeley, after which she uh, ended up at the University of Alberta in the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology, where she's currently a Professor Emeritus. Uh, so Michelle's got a very long, uh, very varied uh, research record, a very distinguished record on topics ranging from demand analysis to food markets in African countries. Uh, but you know, among these very broad topics, we, we can identify some prominent threads. One is some of her early work on uh, agricultural marketing institutions in Canada, uh, specifically some of the economic effects of Canada's supply management regime, which she describes as being controversial research, which I can certainly relate to. Um, and, and her more recent work, uh, some of her more recent work is, is focused on consumer perceptions of food and food safety, specifically some of the trade-offs um, on policies that might require labeling of food products such as GM and other novel products. And she's also spent a lot of time thinking about um, international trade, which is what she's gonna be talking about most of the time today. <clears throat> so Michelle is also, she's, she's a uh, lifetime honorary member of the International Association of Agricultural Economists. She's a fellow of the Canadian Economic Society, Agricultural Economic Society, uh, as well as being past president. 
Uh, and she was also a, um, a board of director member at uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute, so very prestigious title in NCV. So I, uh, I won't take any more time away from Michelle, so it's great to have her here, and if you can help me welcome Michelle Veeman, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm hooked up to a, to a mic, which I'm not used to. So um, does it work? Can you hear me? Uh, people in the back hear me? OK, that's great. Fantastic. And um, my, uh, my, uh, my topic, um, how politics is trumping economics, is uh, dedicated to a previous colleague and a person who's rightly honored at this university for his contributions to teaching, research, collegiality, to the profession and the industry. So I'm honored and I thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. So um, in uh, June 2016, for the Canadian AgiCon and for the uh, Western AgiCon, I discussed trade policy for agriculture and forestry. Can economics trump politics. My response, which was four months before Mr. Trump was elected, was surely yes. Um, when I consider this question today, and my question today is, why is politics increasingly trumping economics? I have to say that if I was asked the question of, of 2016, I would say, uh, sadly, perhaps, perhaps, Politics, politics is trumping economics. So the things I want to talk about are partly uh, trade wars, about the WTO brought to inaction in trade dispute resolution. And um, I've got a question which worries me. I don't have the answer to it, but it's if. If the WTO dispute resolution system can't function, how effective will the WTO be? And uh, I wish I knew the answers to some of these questions. I don't have them, and um, I suspect that nobody has them, but um, I hope we're all thinking about them. So many um, eminent scholars have spoken at this lecture and other visitors to this university and others in the profession who are able to demonstrate that specialising in trade, uh, production and trade, according to relative comparative advantage of regions, of nations, does have benefits overall. And if you compare it to no trade at all, that is, of course. So the pie is larger as the vernacular goes, and the pie is sufficiently large that it should be able to, comp to compensate those who inevitably get left behind or who lose from adjustments. However, Compensation tends to be highly politicized, and it can take many forms. It can even be minor. And uh, distribution of benefits, of course, is not strictly within the economics realm, maybe just as well, but it's very much within the political realm. And so it's, it's, it involves both political issues and economic issues. So trade does provide major economic benefits, but compensation as I mentioned, it's, is very much a, um, a political issue. And the presence or lack of compensation is very political. And I'm going to argue that one of the major um, um, opponents of trade comes from the fact that compensation isn't always very fair and isn't always very evident. And uh, I also um, want to comment on the fact here that the ability to fend off adjustment to trade through protection and support creates rents. And once those rents are created, there's a major um, impetus to defend them. And this is a strong reason why some industries and, um, who, who have achieved that status lobby for protection. Uh, they wish to gain um, to retain or create exemptions to freer trade. And uh, this happens, as, the, as we see, 
from the monitoring assessment that is done by international agencies like OECD and WTO that um, uh, in EU agriculture, um, in the US, sugar, cotton, timber, we're conscious of at the moment, and in Canada, dairy and poultry are effectively um, able to lobby to maintain the, um, to protect themselves from freer trade. So I also want to comment on the fact that the textbook case that you see of trade in, 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 your, in your books, uh, for those of you who are here as a lab for, for, one, of, one, of the, uh, for one of your classes, um, looks at a good and it simplifies graphs. And that's great, the principle is there. But in practice, trade is a lot more messy than that, as I think we all see um, when we look at one of the major items that was affected by NAFTA. And this is that trade between two adjacent countries in particular can occur in raw products, in semi-processed products, and processed products at various stages of production. So services are of increasing importance. And technology, investment, and uh, services are vital for the economies of scale and specialization in, in the example of the North American um, auto industry. For, and um, I've listed some of these here, but um, these complex supply chains don't exist in the world of Mr. Trump. Um, um, he um, assumes parts are parts not that parts go across the, um, not that they go across the country or go across the borders um, several, several, several times in the process of, of, of uh, the process of production. And um, this, is, uh, um, this is one of the features of the, the detriment, I think, in the uh, re re replacement of NAFTA. Now, um, I'd like to uh, proceed on to, uh, talk about some of the criticisms of trade. And criticisms of trade are that jobs are lost, jobs are stolen by lower price company, countries, that jobs and autos are stolen by Mexico, which has lower wages, um, that um, manufacturing jobs have been stolen by China's rapid industrialization. And um, um, and the third feature, of course, and tied in with this, is nationalization, populism, authoritarianism, all of which are growing, um, are growing in the world. And uh, I'm going to argue that, um, well, let me wait a minute, but examples are Trump's Make America Great Again, uh, Britain, uh, Johnson's Brexit at any cost. Hopefully it won't be at any cost. And um, the Yellow Vest movement, which is uh, give us our jobs, give us our rights. Um, we must protest. Now, it's sort of interesting because the protagonists are sometimes high-income uh, people from an elite structure, which is true of part of Brexit. But it's also people who come from lower income, lower wage jobs, and that's true also in Brexit. It's basically, um, we don't want those foreigners, we want to have our own sovereignty. Um, it's Trump, make America great again. And um, okay, trade is a lower proportion of uh, national income in the US um, than in the trade um, than in the countries of Canada and Australia and New Zealand and many developing countries where trade is treated much more as a contributor to national income and employment and to growth than it is um, as an enemy. And of course, EU, the yellow, throughout the EU, EU, starting in France, there's been a progression of the yellow vest movement where people who've don't have access to the benefits or feel they do not have access to the benefits of a growing economy, perhaps because of their original immigration status, perhaps because of their
position in society um, want to protest that, um, that feature. So um, I want to argue. Uh, I was just uh, quality uh, improvement here. Okay, and, uh, I'm not ma making it to the uh, end. Should we do the, that? The quality of the presentation is incredible. Uh, the, uh, as you turn around to the slides, oh, oh. It, 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 it ends it, up having a variable volume at the back. Okay, I'm apologies. not sure how uh, we, Apologies. Uh, oh, I won't turn around to the slides. <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> Simple. It seems to be a small item. But, uh, <laughs> it's just a very small feedback. item. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that uh, contributor to quality. So um, I want to argue that trade in itself is not a major disruptor of jobs. It's technology is. How many people read the uh, Globe Mail business report in the last few days? Did you read the article a couple of days ago, which I think was actually on Monday, which pointed out the number of jobs that are declining in the banking system in Canada? And this is caused by automation, allied with digitization. Digitization? And um, so this is not caused by trade. This is something that's caused by a drive in technology, which is increasing. So jobs are disrupted. They're displaced, displaced by technological and institutional change associated with economic growth, which, of course, may be associated with trade, too. Trade should drive economic growth, even if not all of it accrues to the yellow vest people or, or or to the um, or to the people who are, are um, whom I'll talk about, to the lower 50% of the American population who face relatively high taxes relative to the top 1% of population. But anyway, long-standing examples are U.S. and Canadian agriculture and forestry. Anyone who comes from a farm family who maybe has photos around of their grandparents and photos, proud photos of the, 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 complex, um, the complex combines harvesters and uh, of the day, of the horses in the background, and are aware of the family members and the number of people who tended those horses, are very aware of the machine innovations that dramatically changed agriculture in the 1940s, 1950s and which continue to change agriculture as new technology makes life more efficient, makes <laughs> machines more efficient and more expensive, how it becomes possible to monitor um, parts of fields, um, how it becomes possible to gather information, um, and technology substitutes for labor. And this is true in forestry, too. So, there are fewer traditional jobs in these areas, and also in the banks, and also in the grocery stores, um, and also in the uh, also in the clothing stores. Most of retail, as as uh, internet uh, purchasing, internet um, internet sales have taken over from traditional jobs, um, and so um, it is the case that people who are left in those jobs sometimes require more, well, they do require more specialized skills, but it also contributes to lower costs, higher profits, tax, tax revenues, and uh, contributions to national income. So I don't think we can really say um, technology has destroyed jobs. But, and technology is still contributing, as I've just expounded. So we've had these waves of technical and institutional changes in industrialization and automation. Automation, most recently in the banks, grabbing the Globe Mail head headlines. Digitization, internet, artificial intelligence, 3D copying, um, which may well revolutionize um, precise, uh, precise manufacturing processes. They're all accelerated, but they're not directly caused by uh, globalization and trade. And this is another very poignant issue, which um, relates to, um, relates to uh, uh, the recent strike of GM. And um, who will keep their job 
at GM Oshawa in 2019, by the end of 2019. And this is the harsh example of technology disruption. Does anyone follow Bloomberg Business News? Because if you are, you possibly have read this headline. It was in the um, in Bloomberg <coughs> News releases, um, let me see, only about four days ago, approximately four days ago. And I'll read a quote from this news release. GM knows what it needs to do to secure its future. And it's not Rebecca, a production operator at the Oshawa factory with a community college diploma plus 18 months of university who places two belts on an engine every 108 minutes, uh, sorry, 108 seconds, but less seniority than most of her co-workers because of the way seniority was calculated and because she went back to community college for two years, etc. But the person who keeps the job will be Amanda, an electrical engineer with two university degrees, not a PhD, but two university degrees, and um, she has 24 patents to her and her co-workers' name. She oversees a team that designs software for the next set of the next generation of vehicles. She's a software engineer. She's an internet engineer. And she is, well, not internet. She's a software internet engineer. And so she and her small team are going to be concentrated in Oshawa. And they're designing the next generation of cars, which are going to be electrical cars. And so, sadly, Amanda will, um, um, according to uh, Bloomberg News, probably going to get her notice because they're going to continue with some work, apparently, for, for uh, on some parts, to complete some work parts. And uh, she will probably get her notice um, in December. What a great month to get your notice. But it's a sad fact that um, that is what's happening. I'd like to switch a bit and talk more about compensation and <coughs> trickle-down compensation occurs in some economies and I'll give you an example uh, but it's not likely to be successful. Um, the US does have trade adjustment programs but distribution has become increasingly income distribution has become increasingly concentrated in the United States over time. Um, some people here will be aware of the Gini coefficient, which gives, a, 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 if you like, a thumbnail calculation of the percentage of the population relating to the percentage of, of income. But, uh, and that, if you follow that, and you follow, you look, you look up from time to time the US Bureau of the Census um, their publications on income distribution, you'll see that the Gini coefficient for the top 1% of population, and also for the top 10%, but even more for the top 1%, has become more and more concentrated over time. These data go to 2018. But there is a new study around, and it's just been published, and it is published by, it's written by... Um, Sayers and Zuckman, who are university professors at uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, so they must know something, you know, but anyway, <laughs> so, um, so um, sorry, I guess I'll look at this one. So, uh, they have, uh, now they're looking at effective tax rates. These aren't just income tax. They've layered in other taxes, but, and they're looking at the, this particular graph, which I thought was very striking, relates to the 400 wealthiest families in the US and the bottom 50% of families in the US. So these are the effective tax rates, which in 1960 were well over 50% for the 400 wealthiest families. And in 1918, uh, under, um, they are under, uh, no, they're right on 23 23%. And so the bottom 50% of families paid slightly over 20% in, the, uh, in 1960, and the effect of various politicians and political decisions about tax rates, most recently Mr. Trump's Taxes and Jobs is the title of one of the first bills that he put forward, was um, and passed, 
was to mean that the bottom 50% pay slightly higher tax, their taxes are paid at a slightly higher percentage rate, uh, precisely 24.2%, according to Drs. Sayers and Zuckerman. Um, and you can see over time that this has varied a little bit. It's increased through the early 1990s, then fell through the years 2000, and um, upped again in the latter 2000, and most recently in 2018. So this is an interesting paper. It's described as a, quote, book-long paper. It's actually published as a paper. You can buy it on Amazon. And um, its, um, um, uh, its criticism will probably be, uh, well, what taxes are, uh, what additional taxes are factored, uh, factored in, et cetera. But I think the point is there, isn't it? So I guess one can't be surprised that, in fact, many people in the US are very dubious about the gains from trade. First of all, trade is not the major um, uh, contributor to income as it is in other countries, including Canada. And secondly, it appears that there aren't that many gains from trade that end up being distributed to those who are in the lower 50% of, of uh, income levels in the US. So trade does and ca can and does create winners and losers, uh, but many benefits are very broadly dispersed, and they're dispersed through lower costs of living, i.e. prices, plus added taxes and, well, added profits, taxes and GDP. Now, if your only, um, if your only exposure to the costs of trade are um, through the fact that um, cost of living is gradually going down, then you might be justified in being very skeptical about the gains from trade. So, um, and I'll just have a little disquisition. Um, you generally expect gains from trade to be greater the greater our existing trade distortions, but expect costs of adjustment, lost rents, to be greater in these cases. So protecting rents does give incentives to, uh, to lobby and uh, the <laughs> brings us into the political market, and the political market requires resources and votes. Politics trumps economics here. And I will say, however, that um, the general levels of support to agriculture have tended to decline in recent years. Um, they haven't declined much, perhaps, the last couple of years. And in the um, last year, the members of the WTO didn't necessarily view this as being a statement that all the members could agree on. And maybe that was because not all the members of the WTO, not all the constituent members do agree at the moment, but, but um, the, the barriers to agricultural trade have declined, um, and it's an issue of really whether they increase from here on under different views of the importance of trade and the importance of trade to, to growth and to income and to development. So, I'm back to my story. Reactions to technology, unfair income distributions, and the desire to protect economic rents are important, but they're not the, they're not the, the most or necessarily currently the major, of major importance. Um, the concern of many is that the WTO, which really is the backbone of um, how agricultural pr uh, trade has become um, more liberalized over the years, um, is really under attack. And so I'd like to have, uh, pr provide you with a quote from the Director General of the WTO, and um, I've summarized what he said, but every word is here. So this is what he said in 2016. The stockpile of trade dis restrictions in introduced by WTO members since 2008 continued to grow. Only 20% of the restrictions have been rolled back. Pace of removal has been, um, needs to be accelerated, has not accelerated. Continued vigilance and action is, uh, is required. This is what he said 
in the most recent report. And the me most recent report is mounting trade tensions, increases in trade restrictive measures, and continuing economic uncertainty created real challenges for trade in 2018. This is the, mo the most recent year for which the WTO has a full report. And uh, I thought this was very interesting. So trade grew by 4.6% in 2017, grew by 3% in 2018. At the time, uh, Robert Asvido uh, made this, his publication was released. Um, the projection was it would grow by 2.7%. As of last week, the IMF is suggesting that 2.5% is um, likely to be the case in 2008. And the IMF points out that this really increases the risk of a more severe recession. We must all expect a recession may come along, but maybe they're going to be faster and nastier because of, um, if they are faster and nastier, this is reflected in these trade figures. And I'm going to suggest uh, I'm going to suggest that um, even worse, sorry, even worse is the um, the fact that Mr. Trump has led an unprecedented U.S. attack on the principles of the WTO since he was elected in 2016. So. Um, uh, first of all, I think everybody in this room is aware that he started a trade war by a appealing to the US legislation relative to national security by trying to put a blanket tariff on all exports to, that is, imports by the United States on, on aluminum and steel arguing that this was due to national security. Now, <laughs> um, this is protection. As you would expect, it led to retaliation, pretty widespread retaliation. And I have to credit the Canadian government of jumping into retaliation. And I have to um, point out that um, the tariffs on Canada were removed a month later, as should be the case. <coughs> They're supposed to be... NAFTA um, members. But the subsequent es escalation and wider US tariff attacks have um, touched most of the world. They've hurt US agricultural exports. They've led to large, um, <laughs> they've led Mr. Trump to recognize the harm to US agricultural producers and to promise very large. Uh, transfers to U.S. farm producers of the order of, um, let me see, I believe it's about $16 billion. It's a, uh, don't, don't, please don't quote me on that because I have to double check, but um, it's a mind-boggling sum in, uh, in, in potential promised um, transfers, raising the whole issue of subsidy issues and subsidization, which were a real problem for the WTO, which have been gradually beaten down over time. So um, this has disadvantaged other farm exporters. And uh, overall, this has had punitive effects on producers, exporters, consumers, and trade in agricultural trade, and not just in agricultural trade, in other products trade as well. I have to keep an eye on the time here. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention that the tariffs on steel and aluminum imported from China by the U.S. firms and by the U.S. plants of Canadian companies um, were increased to 25% in uh, May 2019, hurting numbers of firms. I mean, this, this inevitably transfers to the rest of the world. Um, if, um, so it's transferred to firms like Dorel, which makes um, baby stuff and bicycles. If you're a bicycle maker, you, you might be, or a bicycle user, you might be aware of the fact that um, their prices are under pressure, their sales are under pressure, their profits are under pressure. Um, 
if you're interested in or aware of Linema, which um, um, makes farm machinery as well as uh, uh, being a major car parts producer and um, contributor to employment in this country and, and other areas where it has plants, um, is uh, suffering major problems with its, with its profits due to the, um, basically the tariffs on aluminum and, uh, and steel. So this is punitive effects generally. So that, um, and of course, the other aspect is that Mr. Trump has pursued is trade war with China. And this is a series of escalating tra tariffs and trade restrictions, and um, Mr. Trump has cited um, unfair trade practices, the fact there is a trade deficit. Um, economists believe that there may well be trade deficits with some countries. The issue is the, and your entire deficit. You're, you're not expected to not run a deficit with individual countries. You, um, your relative strengths and your trading partner's relative strengths will, will modify that. But um, that, the th and so they also cited theft of intellectual property and forced transfer of intellectual property to China. Uh, some of these things probably have occurred. Some of these things are changing, um, provided, in fact, um, firms register their patents in both China and in, their, and in other countries. But anyway, um, these are the allegations. They've been met with retaliation. They've escalated. So, um, and um, very, very recently, they, so the uh, US-China has been undertaking trade talks, of course, you're probably aware if you read the business news. And uh, most recently, the Commerce Department has banned a number of US firms from uh, software and hardware sales. So this applies to um, software and hardware that would come from 20 important Chinese AI firms and um, the US has blacklisted eight firms, uh, which are, are growing firms, whose products, quote, facilitate um, surveillance of the Muslim minority in parts of, uh, of China. So uh, the, the economist said this ban hits at the hearts of China's AI um, uh, ambitions. So um, normally, if countries have concerns with trade and uh, uh, unfair practices, they normally take them to a WTO um, court. And uh, however, the process by which this is normally pursued is actively being destroyed by the current uh, US president, who um, really doesn't have much time for uh, multilateral trade agreements. You will possibly all remember that he wanted to get rid of uh, NAFTA and did his best. Um, he wanted to get rid of the dispute resolution processes within NAFTA. And I have to credit the current um, uh, Canadian company about, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the current Canadian um, uh, uh, politicians and government in managing for, to forestall that at some cost, perhaps, of giving up some other concessions. But that was very important. So these are issues. So there's an on again, off again. Um, so most recently, US and China are saying that, they, um, that the US will shelve um, a series of planned increases on tariffs. Beijing will buy 400 to 500 dollars US of agricultural products. Most recently 500 is cited. That's not good news for countries like Canada where, who rely on comparative advantage in our established trade ties if in fact a country which has a planned economy um, but, but where um, in fact it has a relatively freer economy than it once did, but there's still a large element of central planning. If it, in fact, 
moves to uh, focus trade with the with our largest competitor, uh, we're, we're moving quite a ways away from the concepts of free trade. So the saga continues. Um, uh, Mr. Trump has claimed success in stage one negotiations for, for a prospective US-China agreement, um, and we all wait to see what's going to come out of that. Um, but um, one suspects it's probably going to hurt third country exporters like, um, like Canada, especially on agricultural trade. So, are the Trump tariffs WTO legal? Well, I don't, I don't think anyone would think that they're in accord with the WTO principles of equal and fair treatment of, of, uh, of WTO members, and we could go down the list of principles that the WTO proclaims. And um, the appeal to national security um, is hardly very um, persuasive to the rest of us. And tariffs are increasingly being applied for political reasons. And I, and I'm sure you, could come up with lots of different um, examples. I've got one example here. Sorry, I can't turn around. Um, and that is the threat to Mexico demanding action to reduce or eliminate the number of illegal aliens crossing into the US. Uh, this was a May 31, 2019 threat. So this is having major effects on many countries and it's increasing the threat of recession. Um, we must eventually expect some moderation in economic um, activity, but, uh, we've ha but um, this is not going to help. And so, as well, Mr. Trump claims that the WTO dispute settlement system is unfair to the United States. And I guess some reason is some cases go against US law and uh, legislation, and the process takes too long. Well, let me tell you that it's taking much longer these days because the US is... Um, is is preventing the appointment of any new appointees to, to, the, um, to the appellate body, as this section is called. So we're down to, I think we're down to about three at the moment. They are there for fixed terms. Um, cases that have been in process for a long time can go back to the original group of arbitrators but it's calculated, or the WTO itself points out, that by December um, there's going to be one person on the appellate, on the, uh, amongst these seven appellate board members. You can't hear a case with them. He's basically the legs have been cut out from the official multilateral dispute settlement mechanism. So this is a um, this is not a good situation. So. <laughs> This is something that might give you a bit of a chuckle, a bit of a sad chuckle. And this is the considerable irony in the US determination to veto appointments to the appellate body since the election of Mr. Trump, because there's been a long-standing US complaint of EU Airbus subsidies, as there actually is a long-standing EU uh, complaint against US <laughs> Boeing subsidies. And the, um, the, uh, the report in early 2019 found in favor of the US, enabling the US plan to apply punitive tariffs on specific EU countries and export products. Um, if some of the students here have taken trade issues, you might or might not remember that um, there was a country of origin or cool um, labeling which, which Canada bought a case against the US, and that was found in our favor, and uh, required um, changes that was found to be an unfair application for various reasons I don't have time to talk about. But um, if you, and in Canada's case, we threatened um, carefully chosen tariffs against carefully chosen uh, industries, and the US back down. So an interesting feature is that there's a similar EU complaint against the subsidization of Boeing, which is in process. It will probably um, give its report. It will probably be concluded within the next few months. 
and it's probably going to find exactly the same thing. Now, the US was eagerly, Mr. Trump was eagerly planning tariffs against the EU. Um, I think they might be in suspension awaiting, um, 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 awaiting finalization, but this is an interesting, very interesting case. So, it's now generally agreed that uncertainty and increased costs are slowing global growth, um, directly arising from this trade war. And this is particularly true for trade-dependent countries, which includes Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and numbers of developing countries as well. That this is, uh, this is slower global growth in manufacturing, crowding out farm products trade, threatening employment levels, and likely to uh, contribute to the inevitable recession, which we may expect after some decade plus of good times, to uh, have a much worse, uh, much worse conclusion. So um, here's some more irony. Um, US exports will finally have access to some of the 2017 Trans-Pacific Partnership details um, uh, through a separate agreement with Japan. Now, the TPP, or now, uh, the initials are slightly different, but um, my brain's so old it only holds certain numbers of, of, of numerals. You're, you're supposed to laugh, not politely <laughs> keep quiet. <laughs> but um, but um, he... Uh, but... The U.S. was, um, no country was an actual signatory. It was not signed in advance. So when Mr. Trump took office, he took great delight in withdrawing the U.S. from the TPP. The TPP was to be, the, is each country who signed enters when they please. And so it's primarily higher income countries, but um, lower income countries are starting to... Uh, move in, and uh, Mr. Trump called this a very poor deal. Well, under pressure from U.S. farmers for better access when TPP members um, like New Zealand, Australia, uh, and uh, Canada were um, able to capture more exports of beef, for example, and pork, um, in, um, in the Japanese markets, um, uh, Mr. Trump um, announced agreement with Japan to at least finally to pr provide uh, the, TP the U.S. with some TPP access. This is going to cover two portions of the agreement, agriculture and digital trade. So, as some economic commentators have noted, there is some room for Canada, um, if our exporters um, see um, and pursue the opportunity to, to um, seize the day in the manufacturing area. Um, Maybe a bit of a push, but it's something that should be pers pursued. Um, the TPP, um, the, this Japanese access won't come in, doesn't come into immediate attention. But we've also got to mention Mr. NAFTA's, Mr. Trump's actions re NAFTA, which um, uh, basically led, led to its characterization as the worst trade deed, deed ever. And I have to say that the current government does receive, should receive kudos, and I'm surprised they didn't make more um, effort to point this out in the recent election, that they basically managed to retain NAFTA um, with, at some cost, of course, so it's a, uh, NAFTA now has higher costs and uh, um, it distributes relatively more benefits to the U.S., but it's got major features of this very important pact. So, and it retains dispute settlement, which was a priority for Mr. Trump to, um, to, to delete. So... Um, and the other feature that's really messing up world trade at the moment involves China's actions. We are very much at odds with the country of China. I think everybody here is aware 
that um, political events have overwhelmed economic events. And uh, so it's very, uh, so um, Canada is bringing a case through the WTO against China on this issue. Um, I hope it goes into play while there's still three, uh, three members of the, uh, <laughs> of the panel still available. But it's pretty hard to prove the case because China is suffering severe effects of the African uh, swine flu virus on their pig population. And that's leading to less um, feed use. Now, soy is the major um, issue here, is the major grain here which, which is affected, which is um, less of an impact on Canada than on some other areas. And uh, um, the, uh, on the uh, issue of meats, where pests and mislabeling have been made, and so there have been no recent shipments over past months. It's, these are apparently dubious, but it's pretty hard to prove. So, so what should be the Canadian reaction? What is the Canadian reaction? Persuasion, well, that's what we're trying. And um, the, um, the, uh, uh, there are other ways. Should we be taking a tough line? And uh, the um, McDonald Laurier Institute has got some interesting uh, suggestions here. And that's, um, that is, let me fill in my notes, which I've managed to leave to, uh, to lose here. So, um, anyway, let's, um, hang on. Uh, so, the suggested lines, and these come from Duan Jie Chen of the McDonald Laurier uh, Institute, suggests banning Huawei from any involvement in Canada's 5G network. <coughs> Well, that'd be a pretty tough thing, and our telecom companies wouldn't care for it. But they probably accepted that um, on at least some of the non-essential, less security-dependent features that may, uh, may, um, uh, they may be beaten out by the political pressures. Um, expand existing uh, insurance programs to help Canadian farmers deal with the chronic coercion from China. Well, um, that deserves a fault, that deserves attention, but the suggestion is that these come from funds which are currently committed uh, to Canada's capital share in the China-led Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which would be a bit of a political push, wouldn't it, uh, but would catch attention. And it's argued that registering and uh, scrutinizing all R&D funding sources from China should be sensibly done because there is this allegation which the US gives very strongly about intellectual property appropriation threat uh, through pressure on uh, research and uh, business entities and um, withdraw Canada's membership from the Asian, um, uh, the new Asian uh, bank, um, uh, which would be uh, perhaps something that might be, <laughs> might be a pretty tough idea to take. Now, I take it that the McDonald um, Laurier Institute is in fact fostering it. They have a conference going on the 28th of this month. If I lived a little closer, I would be happy to attend the conference, but uh, it's a, um, it's an interesting, uh, interesting series. So another issue which comes out of um, uh, other colleagues' comments is, uh, should we discard the WTO? Um, and I would say no, it is far too valuable to discard. So the WTO process of dispute settlement is very much under attack. And uh, it works by consensus. Mr. Trump has uh, blocked appointments, so we're down to, um, uh, the, uh, to the point where new appeals can't go on before uh, after December. So no, we can't discard the system. So I think it's important to remind ourselves of the virtues of the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade and its WTO successor. The 
get general agreements on tariffs and trade introduced in the late 1940s to aid in economic recovery from and to avoid um, the wars and depressions of previous years that had characterized the early part of the 1900s. And agriculture, um, so this, this um, was, so the, this agreement led to the institution of the WTO to replace the general agreement on tariffs and trade as a permanent body rather than just a treaty um, at the conclusion of the Uruguay Round Trade Agreements. And why was agriculture essentially omitted in these early years of the gap? Well, food security was pretty much uh, a big, big issue in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. And agricultural protectionism became very, very widespread. And we refer to mountains of butter and lakes of wine at distorted world prices, uh, dumped food aid, which penalized less developing country agriculture and efficient exporters. So it's useful to remind ourselves of the benefits of um, the, and the virtues of the WTO. The Uruguay Round essentially brought agriculture into the, um, the per new permanent body of the WTO. But many people, including ourselves, table very high levels of tariff protection and for some of those, we haven't really reduced them very much. And, but nonetheless, agricultural support has, has, has reduced to some extent. The big push of the Doha around uh, was successful in agreements to phase out agricultural export subsidies. And, but we seem to be, we've moved along, but it seems to be, um, we seem to be, we seem to be, uns we seem to be stymied. Um, and I um, want to uh, comment on um, a, a report by three um, eminent colleagues, three Ontario colleagues, Al Mussel, Doug Headley, and Ted Billier, shifting geopolitics and trade policy with a Canadian agricultural food policy. This is October of this year. It concludes that the multilateral trade system may be fundamentally damaged. And um, one of the suggestions is that Canada could consider taxes on imports of high carbon input farm products. Now, I think that a very, very dangerous um, suggestion, particularly coming from Alberta, which feels um, and um, adjacent Saskatchewan feel rather bruised by um, the uh, by, <laughs> by the conflict um, between environment and existing or prospective Canadian oil development and exports. So um, anyway, I think we have to stick by the principles of the WTO: non-discrimination, national treatment, free trade predictability, promote fair competition and transparency, encourage development and economic report, re reform. Um, these are worth a lot. They've been very valuable to agriculture and agricultural trade in the decades since, the, um, since we've been able to negotiate internationally. Um, and uh, there's a case for education, I think, but there's also a case for us to be aware of this as parents, if we are parents, as educators, as family members. Because, as Winston Churchill pointed out, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And we sort of see that at the moment with Mr. Trump, I'm afraid. He is repeating history, which led to depression and war, or war and depression. So. We need to um, continue, I believe, the fight to make trade freer. And uh, the WTO does more than settle disputes, um, but um, uh, fixing the current impasse in the, um, in the uh, dispute settlement process is going to take um, concentrated global effort. And the next 
meeting, formal meeting of first minister is in Kazakhstan. Um, the appeals procedure is not going to continue to then. It's going to essentially expire this December. So I want to thank you all for listening and I want to um, uh, mention that if there's time, comments and suggestions are, um, are welcome and I want to thank the organisers for inviting me to give this presentation which honours the many and varied contributions of a previous, previous colleague, Daryl Craft. So, thank you. for some questions and uh, secondly uh, uh, for uh, the students a few students uh, mentioned to me that uh, at 450 for 30 they have some obligations and so on uh, we have a folder at the back that my uh, questions to you uh, that I hope help you focus on the presentation uh, handed in to the uh, the uh, young lady with the purple folder uh, and, uh, and uh, let's start the questions first, because uh, Michelle certainly gave us a lot to think about, and those of us who uh, almost avoid uh, television since Mr. Trump came in uh, are really wondering where we are going with trade, and can we actually teach trade courses like we used to? Good question. Yeah. So, any questions? Yes. Uh, so China wasn't a very fair trader to start no. with. So it was playing hardball with them, not a possibly a good strategy. Um, Did the, everyone get the question? China wasn't a fair trader to start off with, and so was playing hardball with them, maybe it's a good <coughs> strategy. Well, the U.S. hardball is hardball for the U.S. sake, okay? It's not going to benefit Canada. Um, Canada has had a very good relationship with China over the years, um, which appears to have become overcome by politics. Um, the points from the Macdonald Laurier um, that I pointed out, I think they're worthy of debate. I think Macdonald Laurier um, Institute are meeting, or they've got a public meeting on the 28th, if I live closer. <laughs> to the centre of power and influence in the country, I might be, th I might be there. But um, the argument, their argument is that rolling over doesn't work. So um, I would hate to move to the strongest um, level, but I, I hope our politicians are thinking about this and talk and perhaps talking about it. But, but. Um, but uh, uh, the other alternative is to discard the WTO, and I think that would be a, a dreadful, dreadful error. Yeah. Another question. Uh, there was one at the back, I believe, Dr. Turkinowitz. Thank you very much for that presentation, Michelle. The spirit of Daryl Kraft laid out the trade policy uh, issues very well. Uh, there was, uh, we talked about the U.S. and China, etc. but what about Canada and some of its uh, policies? And I think you've heard of the subject of supply management. Uh, would you maybe comment on where supply management fits on politics trumping economics? Yes. Well, sadly, supply management, politics has trumped economics very, very effectively. And it's interesting that some of the... Um, some of the recent issues, the, um, uh, the reversion of classes back to where they were originally, um, and that came at a substantial taxpayer cost, might I understand, as I understand. But um, it's a, a very difficult issue because we have essentially every political party is, um, is uh, unwilling to tackle this issue, um, and uh, um, perhaps this is even more evident in a in a in a climate of uh, the election last evening, where 
um, a more um, determined group of and solidified group of, of, of politicians are now in power in Quebec, um, where the bloc is essentially in power. So I don't know uh, what we do about this, Ed. I think, um, uh, I, I suspect that if we are going to persuade China and um, other recalcitrant com countries um, to, uh, uh, to follow rules, we might have to forego our exemption. After all, when these exemption areas were carved out, there was an understanding that they would be phased out. No political party has, has, um, had, the, uh, has had the moral fortitude to do that, and the one who did um, didn't win, went out on a limb and bought other issues and, and, and is no longer um, has, a, has, has a seat in Parliament as of... Uh, uh, um, I have an unopened board game at home called Trudeau. <laughs> T-R-U-E-D-O-U-G-H, and I, I thought, uh, jumping uh, economics, maybe we have the true dough of supply management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, thank, you for your, thank you for your question. As someone who was born and got my initial education in New Zealand, at a time when New Zealand was highly protected, walled off by tariff barriers, and eventually um, said no, um, We've had it dismantled all the systems that were there that were protective. Um, I have to agree that that should be done. I have to also say that when you're a small, powerful group, and it's just been I believe we just read in the in, in one of our well appreciated farm newspapers um, what the annual dues are that dairy farmers. Um, provide, we can understand how much lobbying, or just general observation, tells us how much lobbying pressure is there. But Canada may have to decide um, how much we agree, you know, how much we um, wish to um, uh, accept free trade. We and have two more questions. Not just one, two. <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's possible the U.S. administration is focused more on their economic lead over other countries versus actual economic growth in the future. Um, sorry, if it's possible for who to focus? If, if the U.S. administration is yeah. focused on yeah. their economic lead, yeah. like, it's possible that they, they don't really need to maintain the level of growth they've had in the past, yeah. provided other countries. Yeah. Well, I suspect, uh, I suspect that will depend on the new, next U.S. election, won't it? Because this is a very Trumpian view. The U.S. has a privileged position on um, these various international bodies. The U.S. was a leading figure in their initial development, including the initial development of the WTO. That's perhaps why Mr. Trump has the unusual position of being having one American member of the seven-member um, uh, 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 body of the, uh, of the appellate body. And um, so uh, uh, I would think that with... Um, uh, I wouldn't want to flip a coin, but I fear that impeachment may increase his chances of re-election. I'm not a political scientist, but... That's what the political scientists suggest. So, um, so I would like to agree with you, but we may need another president to make that argument. And to be quite honest, I worry uh, something called hysteresis. You know, when, when you go off in this direction, it's not always possible to come back to your starting place. You <laughs> may verge back to a more protected rather than an unprotected world. But thank you, that's an interesting issue. What was the other question? Mr. Rowley, question. Yeah, I'm curious. You didn't really mention bilateral trade agreements. Maybe they're the way of the future. Well, this is Mr. Trump's idea. And really, it's the idea, divide up your enemies and conquer. Because when the largest economy, the most, you know, the, literally, the, the leader of the free world, but not only the leader of the free world, the largest economy in this world, um, 
uh, applies a <laughs> negotiating power. Uh, think about what happened with NAFTA. We were lucky that our politicians managed to keep the dispute settlement mechanism and had to give up maybe the amount of money that we've paid to some industries subsequently. But um, the US is pretty hard to flout and it's, uh, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, so let's put it this way. It's better to have individual ag trade agreements than no agreements. Um, many people, myself include, include, believe it's better to have multilateral trade agreements because you're not throwing the small economies out of the boat. You're, you're saying development matters and uh, let's have equal treatment. So anyway, that would be my philosophy, but I agree with the point that some trade is better than no trade, but free trade is better than, than, than both. So I'll maybe draw things to a close. Before an applause, let me uh, just have a couple comments. Uh, we actually have a, uh, a dean's boardroom, a reception, that uh, there's room for a few people to uh, mull around and, uh, and have a soft drink uh, or whatever we, uh, we have. And uh, uh, Michelle uh, will be making herself available there. So for those of you that have visited from far, feel quite free to join us for uh, uh, for, uh, for that uh, board, Dean's boardroom reception uh, that uh, will basically go from 4.30 to 5, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, uh, just for your information, uh, Michelle uh, and her husband Terry will be joining uh, the Kraft family and some friends for dinner tonight. And uh, during that dinner then we'll have an opportunity to thank Michelle for being the Kraft lecturer for this year and uh, with a small uh, token to uh, commemorate that, uh, uh, that cooperation and coming in thank and you. filling that role. So I'd like to uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And thank you, audience. Thank you.